Um, I've been a Seventh-day Adventist now for uh, 45 years. Amen. Amen. And during that time, unfortunately, I've witnessed um, indirectly some instances of abuse. People who held offices in the church, the most vocal leaders, and yet their families were terrorized in their homes. And I like it how the end of our reading says how that is not God's plan. And you know a child growing up in that environment will reject anything that has to do with God. I heard a minister years ago say that a little boy told him, if God is anything like my father, I don't want to have anything to do with him. Right? But it's men like the leaders we have here and others who are willing to pray for others, pray with their wives, pray with their children, and be examples in the home that really can counter, counter that. So uh, where's my, my AV person? <laughs> So what you have in your hand should be the power and control will and the power of equality, or the, the equality will. And then you <clears throat> have a copy of the vignettes. So do you have both? OK. Um, I like to start off with the power and control, because this is, this is really what this whole abuse issue is. As, as Pastor mentioned earlier, there this notion of abuse of power. If one doesn't see him or herself as powerful, then they have nothing to work with, right? And a lot of times, it's because of their perception of themselves that they might wield power over another. OK, is it, does everybody have it? So if you, if you look at the power and control wheel on your left, or right, whatever. But you see there's various uh, areas or criteria. There's emotional, economic, coercion and threats, intimidation, the use of children, uh, minimizing, denying, male privilege. I'm going to point out something. Because typically, as Pastor mentioned earlier today, typically, when we think of abuse, we think of men abusing women because women are, are usually smaller uh, and less strong. And so men will use their size, they'll use their voice to intimidate, but there are women, there are women who are abusers. They can be physical abusers, they can be emotional and verbal abusers. And those, and we have women who can be, as parents, who are abusive in that way. So we're going to talk, I'm not going to leave anybody out, because just as we talked about earlier, and I think we even talked about a little bit in Sabbath school, we have to be accountable. Each of us has to be accountable. And then if you look at the equality wheel, then what we have here, and the biggest thing is negotiation. You know, when you can communicate, when there's give and take, that's what God designed. He made Eve as Adam's, what? His helpmate, right? To be by his side, not under his foot um, or behind him. We see responsible parenting. We see honesty and accountability. Economic partnership, right? There is a mutuality, which uh, we, we will talk about here. So where is my person given the slides? Can you go to the next slide? Oh, 
Oh, now we have a new person. Okay. So we talked, Pastor talked about this today. You know, is this good or bad? They're both uh, something that could do harm, de depending on the intent. And he went through um, some of the persons in the Bible, and he went to Judges 19, which was not mentioned in here, and then talked a little bit about David. You know, David is somebody that God loves so dearly. But when we look at that story about Bathsheba and David, you think about it from Bathsheba's point of view. I have heard pastors say Bathsheba knew what she was doing. She knew the king would come out, whatever. They blamed her. I've heard that. But what was Bathsheba to do when the king beckoned her? What, what was she to do? If she had refused, she could have run the risk of being killed. True? Yeah. And if you look at Bathsheba's kind of trajectory, even later on, when Adonijah came to her, one of David's sons, and said, you know what? I want you to talk to the king, Solomon, at that time. And I want him, I want you to talk to him about giving me rulership or whatever. Did I mess the story up? But we know that Bathsheba just complied. And you kind of think, like, what was she thinking? It's so easy to be in a modern day and be critical of these women, but they had very little power. And how do I turn this down? Can you turn it down? Can you turn it down, please? So I have a, I have a quiz for you. And like good students, I just want you to raise your hand if you know the answer. How do you spell power? Power. How do you spell power? I, I don't see any hands go up. What's this? Just, it's a, who Tom says it's a trick. Don't you trust me? Okay, go ahead. How do you spell power? We have two, two, two people smartest in the room. P-O-W-E-R-C-H-O-I. -E. What does that spell? That's your power. That's power. And the abuse is this. I don't think it was defined in this way in my notes, but abuse is when you take a person's choice. Right? Because then you have, because think about it. God gives us a choice. Huh? Yeah. Amen. Okay. Amen. <laughs> it's the truth. God in Christ hung on that tree knowing that most of the people there would choose not to follow. And he died anyway. So let's continue. Can you go to the next slide? You know, we talked about, can you please go to the next slide? We talked about positional power, and we got that. Um, there are people in various vocations, <clears throat> but there, we don't, and we often think, as I said earlier, you think of men in these positions, but a caregiver is often thought of as a woman, right? but we can certainly have male caregivers. But there's also, um, and let's go to the next slide that talks about economic types of abuse, et cetera. All right. But I, I'd like to also bring something else in because there is such a thing as woman-on-woman -woman abuse. Ooh. Now, you know how women can abuse each other? It's not with physical. We are much more, you know, we use our words. We discount each other. Somebody, you're talking to someone, say, oh, I already know about that, I don't wanna hear that. Listen, when it happened to me, such and such, and that's called discounting. We don't, when, when a man does it to a woman, we're just victimized, but if you're doing it to another woman, we do that to each other. 
a biblical example. The woman at the well. Who usually went to the well to get water? Was it the men or the, the women? So why did this woman show up in the heat of the day to get water? She was avoiding the other women because these women looked down on her. After all, she'd had, what? Jesus told her, you had five husbands. So it was the good women of the church that drove her away. But she had an encounter with Jesus Christ, and that's the point. Every one of us has to have that personal encounter to make a difference. But it was women in the church, right? Pastor's wife, head elder's wife, the head deaconess, whatever you want to say. These were the ones that made her feel that she would rather suffer the hot sun rather than encounter them. And can we look at modern examples? Yes, we can. And then we wonder what happens to our young people. Another type of abuse. You know, these young people, why doesn't she wear that kind of thing to church? Look at how his hair is. What is why, why didn't he pull up his pants? Or why is his hair blue or green? Whatever. That's also a type of abuse. It's emotional abuse. It's class abuse, if you will. Because we're still setting ourselves up as if we can judge someone else. And the young people come to us with the thought, how do you love me now? They want to know, I want to hear about Jesus, but where is he in you? All right, let's go to the next slide. So, we know we hear stories about abuse in other countries. And in the West, you know, we think we're the postmodern world, we feel pretty smug about who we are. But the truth is, we may not be performing genital mutilation on women, but if you are holding a woman hostage economically, if you are emotionally abusive, if you are, because we, we think mainly physical, that's very obvious. But these are the things that can still characterize victimization. And it doesn't have to be the kinds of things that we are all, oh my goodness, that, that could, that's terrible. But when it happens here, in other ways, we need to be able to recognize it. So it says here, when boundaries are crossed, someone always gets hurt. And often it's the person who has the power as well as the victim. What do you think about that statement? Because it seems to be inclusive. What do you think? You know what, and I'm gonna try to talk to y'all and get you involved, because you just had lunch. So we're not gonna, I'm not gonna let you sit back there and just kind of be passive. <laughs> Yes. It seems like a uh, how the contradictory statement. Yeah. Because so far what you have shared with us is that the person in power usually got the abuse. So they are the team where both can be the victim. Maybe I just don't try to think. Yeah, I'd like, I'd like us to, yeah, thank you. Because what does it mean that the boundaries are crossed, someone gets hurt, and often it's the person who has the power as well as the victim? What does that mean? Tony. It almost sounds like, um, you know, the, the person that has the power becomes the victim of something. Ha. Huh. Oh, did you hear what she said? It's like the victim who has the power, the person who has the power becomes the victim of Satan. Interesting. Yeah. I was getting ready to tell you something else, but that is an interesting point. And there's also something called, it's carps, triangulation. Uh, you have the victim, you have the victimizer, and then you have something called the rescuer. And depending on how this relationship is set up, the way I read this, 
sometimes the person who is the obvious victimizer can become the victim. Because unfortunately, if this is the way the relationship has been going, there is, a, there is kind of a payoff in this. We don't like, you know, people in uh, domestic violence circles don't like to hear this. But sometimes there is a process of um, agitation, if you will, to keep this whole cycle going. So sometimes the victim might be the victimizer. And maybe in a couple's relationship, they might in all of a sudden bring in the oldest child. And the oldest child then is the one that everybody looks at. And before you know it, there's this cycle. And the roles can be interchangeable. How do you hear that? Do you receive it? You don't have to. I just like some feedback. What do you think? Uh -huh. No, but that's an interesting. Now, what, what Kathy just said was the victim might flirt with other men because she's getting back at her husband who physically abuses her. Oh, sure, it could happen. It could happen. And that's not quite what I meant. But yeah, because in this triangle, there has to be one more person, there has to be a rescuer. So in that instance, maybe the oldest child is the one that comes in and is defending his mother. But as a result of doing that, he becomes a victim to his father. So it can, it can go, but sometimes the mother will provoke things to cause the oldest child to come in and rescue her because she's a martyr. I, I'm not, you know, it can go on and on. You're confused, yeah. It can be confusing. What I was thinking about is uh, what happened in the uh, in prison. The girl is addicted, so she got there because it was true. She deserved it was a drug because of uh, trapping and other things. And uh, she became the, uh, the, the abuser of the prison, looking for other victims in order to justify. Oh, yeah, yeah. The pastor is saying, um, he's, he was thinking in terms of when people go to prison, let's say someone goes to jail because uh, they've been um, found guilty of charges of abuse, and they become the abuser. So I saw Carmen and then you, and, and they do that as a way of acting out in prison. That, that can happen, and that's not quite what I'm talking about. Carmen, you had your hand up. Yes. Ah, interesting. So Carmen says there's Satan, us, and God, and God is our rescuer. Yeah, actually I'm not in that sense because my, my model is more imperfect than that because if God is rescuing us, we're rescued for sure. And that, that, uh, that pattern would be stopped. But I love how you guys are thinking. Yeah, hold on, I want Gabby. That was it. There's this, these, these family dynamics, and then uh, Dornita. 
But the deal is, yeah, it's usually the husband and wife, father and mother, and that oldest child gets brought in, or, or only child, but there's, there's someone that they bring in, it's called triangulation, and that person then, whatever tension was going on between the husband, the primary people, this third person kind of relieves the tension, and the attention now is on that rescuer, who now becomes the victim. As in her example, the parent, the mother is being abused by her husband. The mother brings in the oldest child. The father is, takes away attention from the mother and puts it on the oldest child, who now becomes the new victim. And then the mother becomes the rescuer. And the beat goes on. They keep this going. If, if Christ were invited, some of the examples you gave, like the one you gave, Carmen, that would be wonderful because then people could see that what they're doing, because we're going to talk about that too. They could see what they're doing, confess, and stop. But, but when I talk about there's a payoff, um, there actually are some neurological um, changes and there's a kind of reward that happens in keeping this kind of tension going. If that's the family dynamics, you keep that going. The, it's not mentioned in our slides because that's not as evident in the church. But it's like Pastor said earlier today, sometimes there are things that go under the radar. And this is the kind of thing that can happen. And it often happens to the oldest child who becomes parentified. Okay? Now, Dornita, you had your hand up. Well, rescuer. Yeah, it does. It does. But um, when when it said there that the person who is the uh, who causes the hurt becomes the victim. I think in the context of this, and I see your hands, um, it may be implying that they're, they're hurt as a result of acting out against someone they say they love or whatever. But, but what I saw in that was that one becomes the victim. The victimizer, they change roles. It's sometimes interchangeable. And that's a reality that's not really mentioned in these slides. Oh, wait, your sister, tell me your name. Maria, Maria and then Gabby. Oh, oh okay. <laughs> Yes. Does, you hear this? It's generational. 
You know what, and I, I, I need to acknowledge something. I want to talk about it right now. Whatever we say here today, it's, it's, there, there's something that will be brought up, and I want, I want to be sensitive to people's realities. So this is not something where you go and just talk about it, wonder about it. It's a reality. that It happens in our church. We need to look at it and, and deal with it. We have to be Christ, like Christ, to those among us. And I believe every one of us here can agree, or will agree. I just want you in your hearts to agree that it's confidential, there's no blaming, there's no judgment. All right? Okay, my sister, you had a comment. Hmm? Oh, it was Tom? Yeah. Oh, sorry, Tom. Uh, I, I heard a couple, some, couple people said they didn't find the storm there. And I thought of an example where this is true. Uh, when boundaries are crossed, so let's say, because I've seen this happen in Hammond, that's the, probably the largest church in Hammond. A pastor has sex, uses his power to have sex with a young lady. He got hurt, because she turned out to be underage, and he went across the straight line. She got hurt, the church got hurt, but there's still all those things that the mission of the church does. That, thank you, That's, that really fleshes it out, because I, I, I know that example. The, the point is, it's, it's um, you know, with God, everything is order. It's symmetrical. Things don't just happen, and there's no outcome from whatever that was. That's why I talk about power is choice. Because the decisions we make, let's go back to the garden, the decisions we make have long-lasting consequences. Yes, ma'am. Mm -hmm. I'm not speaking any because I'm quiet. I never say, I never told my, uh, my sons, you know, your father did this. When it's little, when, when the boys see more, the boys know and who is real the father is. And, and, and my family, I never see this. It's more than that people, so they have to make sisters. But I, I, I cannot stand to this person. And this has happened by a man. Mm. And he's a victim than, than all the people. So um, I talked to him last night when we had a baby like this. Why? I don't understand why you talk for so long time, 21 years. You talk what? Yeah. And number one, because I don't have family in this country to me. And number two, 
Mm. So, and what they say, well, you know what? You know what we... I want to go, I want to stay in that church. It's going to leave, it can leave us. <coughs> and, and, and she had to wear my mother and say, okay, I'm the best person. My mom says, if you don't leave that church, you forget that this is coming. Wow. My mother said, because yeah. what? Sure. I'm sorry. And sister, what is your name? Isabel. Isabel? Listen, we could talk a little more, but it sounds like more memories are coming up for you. And that's part of the psychological thing, trying to make it seem like you're, you're the problem. But um, this is, is, I guess part of this, um, I know that part of my objective is to help us to be sensitive to what's the reality Sin is real, and we can flower it up as much as we want, but it's in our midst. And to be able to be sensitive to the needs of others, I think that was shared earlier today. And, and we certainly see that here. Yes, Brother Carlos. Yes, and, and I'm glad, that's a wonderful segue to where I wanna go next. Thank you, Brother Carlos. Because um, the next slide. Hello, you know what? How about if I just keep going? But if we, if we talk about admitting, you know, when, in the sanctuary in the outer court, what was the first thing, the first thing that was encountered was Ah, accountability. Um, and if we think about those, that process of change and contrition is to acknowledge. What is, in, in Psalm 51, I love that, that psalm because it's, um, you know, have mercy on me, O oh God, according to the multitude of your, there has to be contrition and you go to the altar of sacrifice and you put everything there before God. That's the accountability, whatever your position is. Whether you're a spiritual leader, a parent, a teacher, a husband, a wife, if you have sinned against someone else, you've sinned against God. That's what David says in his in Psalm 51, against you and you only have I done this sin, this evil in your sight. That's the process. And once there is accountability, next slide please, then there's this mutuality. Now, when we meet on mutual ground, no one overpowering the other, if you go back to your 
your equality wheel. You know, there's a level of collaboration, um, partnership. But if there's inequality at any level, someone is disadvantaged and there's a much greater chance for power to be misused. But if we come from the perspective of love, Christ's love for us, then there's no big I and little you. Amen? We then can invite someone to, we can come together to Christ. But I raise a question and I want to know just what do you think about this? How does that mutuality occur? What do you think would be the first step? We talk about it in Sabbath school. We talk about it every week. What would have to happen before I could see you as my equal or we could, I could even perceive that I have this mutuality with you? I've been victimizing you. Okay, how does that happen? Forgiveness and love, yeah. Because we love because Christ first loved us. So my point is, I can't get any, I can't do it on my own, yes. Mm. Okay, if it's, if it's not someone you're in a, in a relationship with already. Right. Yeah, absolutely. Barbara said, we have to get to know the person. And that was Christ's method, right? He met people where they were. And if we understand that we are equals under the cross, yeah? So then, then the next slide, please. Then it says, we need to respect. Respect our own boundaries. And we haven't moved yet. So if, if we respect each other, then we have um, an understanding that we each have power. And with the respect, we're, able, we're better able to collaborate. When we work with, not over others, a much better result occurs. In the paradigm of, um, of verbal abuse, which is probably a lot more common than we realize, the, the person who is the abuser is usually someone who doesn't think a lot of him or herself. And they do things to create a paradigm of power over the other. If they share power, then that minimizes who they are, who they perceive themselves to be. Does that make sense? So, you know, it's not uncommon for you to be in a church where maybe there's a pastor who's very bombastic, and fortunately we don't have that, but dogmatic. Um, I've experienced that, you know. Whatever I say goes, you don't question. Yeah, what, Carlos? Yeah. <laughs> it happens. Am I the only one that's experienced that? Um, okay, well, I guess I am. No, okay. Because it does happen, doesn't it? And, you know, then it becomes a matter of how do we, are we our brother's keeper? Are we our sister's keeper? So how, what is that accountability then? How does that look? If you've got a leader who's very dogmatic, bombastic, overbearing, et cetera, et cetera, what do you do? Do you sit in the pews quietly and then go home and talk about him? You say, sure. Huh? No. <laughs> Funny you should come in at that moment. <laughs> but how, how are we then from a place of mutuality and respect to interact with that kind of leader? Yes, 
Yes. Well, and you know what? Thank you. Uh, again, another example, another facet of David. Because he had an opportunity, not once but twice, to actually kill Saul. But he said he wouldn't put his hands on the, the Lord's anointed. So who was he really reverencing in that instance? He, his respect was for God and his decision. And with that in mind, though, I like that you brought him up because let's keep going with that. David was honored by God. And, and, and Saul reaped according to what he sowed, did he not? Right? But how do we then, I, I think Brother Carlos, as a leader, is saying to you guys, I'd like to know what should I do in that instance? Because I've been in churches where if anybody speaks up, it's usually me. That's true. Um, because, you know, I have this thing that God is God. So, I, no offense to you, I love you, but you can't take my choice. God doesn't even take my choice. So, but it's frustrating because if we have been conditioned and we sit under leadership that is not mutually um, sharing power. There's not the mutual, there's not the respect. So how, how is Christ honored in that? What is, what is the role of the body of the, of the church? Okay, Melvin. Thank you, Bob. A dictator. <laughs> a dictator culture, but as you need to follow me and see things the way I see it. And unless there's a those instances, unless there's a plain thus say the Lord, or something is plainly spoken, or when it's in plain direction from the spirit of prophecy, I think we have to be kind of careful that we don't we leave that room for differences of opinion except on matters that clearly spell out well, yeah, I thank you for that. But when you're talking about somebody who's leading and you know they're not leading in the way Christ would have, you know what I'm saying? Because there is a view about the pastor and, and we often sit under leadership that is abusive. Now, I'm not talking out of turn. Since this may be on YouTube, I'm not going to say much more. But I'm, tell, I'm asking. There are examples in the scripture. Paul, what did Paul do when there were instances of misguided leadership? You remember? What did Paul do? I know one instance I think about is there was, uh, it seems like there was a division where people were saying he was baptized by this and baptized by that. Mm -hmm. Alone, as long as it's 
between man and me, a person not heir to God, but a true Okay. So yeah, he brought he brought people back to what's central to our faith. I'm thinking about the instance with Peter and dealing with the Gentiles. And before the leadership came, Peter did he accepted. He went to what the Lord led him to Cornelius, remember? Yeah. Remember? But then when when the rest of the disciples came, uh, Peter was a little skittish. He didn't want to have anything to do with the Gentiles because they weren't circumcised. And Paul confronted him. The but, yeah, the point is, yes, the Bible does give us direction on how to address problems, and it can even be with the leader. But everything should be done in the spirit of Christ. That's, but the point is, but don't do nothing. Now that's a double negative, isn't it? I know. <laughs> but you know what I'm talking about. The whole point is, as Christians, it, when being meek doesn't mean being weak. Amen. So we can get back to this point. Collaboration. Again, it stresses when we work with, not over others, a much better result occurs. One of the things I love about being in this church I see a lot of working with. I'm very grateful to be a part of Hammond Church, but I do see the collaboration. I see the inclusiveness, and it's refreshing. <laughs> it's very refreshing. That's where the Holy Spirit can work, and that's what we want, to be a spirit-filled church. So let's go to positive illustrations in Ephesians chapter 4. I'll get back, and, let's, I, and then we'll do some some things with the uh, vignettes. Um, it, go to the next slide, please. So Ephesians 4, 1, say, oops, go back. And, and following, Paul wrote that believers are urged to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. Be completely humble and gentle, be patient, Keep the unity of the spirit through the bond of peace. Okay. Paul continues in verses 17 to 19, warning us of the futility of wrong thinking and action which leads to darkened understanding, separation from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to the hardening of their hearts. Who, as it, as it relates to the context of of these slides and this ended now perspective. What, who are they talking about here? The church leaders. The church leaders. Okay, Randy. Yeah, I was going to make a comment. You know, what Paul was going through here, the church was just feeling starved. It was going through a learning curve. We were bringing Gentile Christians in with uh, Jewish Christians. Mm -hmm. Ah. Because remember that the uh, Sadducees and Pharisees, uh, many of them were very legalistic. So they had these, they were regimented in this type of belief and behavior. So what now Paul is trying to come across is we need to have the hard hearts need to be softened at this time. Mm -hmm. so Yes. Okay, thank you. Because, you know, what you bring in is the issue around, in that letter, that open letter, the cultural um, differences. And if we were to apply that to now, there is a need for our leadership to be humble. I appreciate the education that the leaders have and what they attain. But at the end of the day, we're still all the same. We're all sinners saved by grace. Amen. Yes. Thing to say about culture. Yeah. Go ahead. You know,
Amen. Randy, Randy said something so important. And it reminded me of a quote that C.D. Brooks, the late C.D. Brooks said, you know, when somebody asked him, what's his sign? He said, the Sabbath. He said, what's his culture? Christ. Amen. And you know, that, that's just the truth. That's, and if, you know, what, when you talk about what many countries outside of the U.S. may do as far as women, if you go back and again, look at the early church, in the book of Acts, and, and a, a lot of Paul's writings, women were guarded with great uh, regard, right? And Christ, I love, you know, uh, there are, you know, there's such a thing as a womanist Bible, you probably have heard of, and you know, the whole notion of feminism ignores the fact that Jesus Christ taught women, I mean, his interaction with women was par excellence, right? He saw every woman as equal as to the males. He, they, they received their proper respect, the mutuality of the cross. If we really follow Christ, then we wouldn't have divisions based on gender or education or economics. And we, and we know that's true. Randy and then Tom. Once he was resurrected. That's, yeah. He went to a woman, Mary. Yeah, he the went to that woman that was thrown at his feet, right? And then he had to go, she had to go tell it to the apostles that were hidden in the upper room. Yeah, yeah. But she wasn't looking. She, did you hear that? So he, she was the bearer of the good news, and they didn't believe her, right? But she had to go find them. They were hiding out. Yes, go ahead, Tony. I do. I don't know about y'all, but when I get to heaven, I'm not going to worry about it. Amen. Okay, go ahead, Brother Carlos. That's right. Living in us, uh, giving us those special traits of character. Then, as a church, we can be united. And if we refuse, if we come into the church with the second part, uh, with wrong thinking, mm -hmm. which will lead to wrong action, which will lead primarily to doctrine and understanding, and ignorance. Amen. That's the key. The Holy Spirit. <laughs> That's just the key. So when we, when we come in unity of the Spirit, then everything changes. I just, because time is marching on, I just thought, do we have time for one vignette? Yeah. Because I, I just um, would like us to kind of go through this. But the whole point of, of looking at Ephesians 4 is showing that 
you know, there's that 425 that talks about don't go to bed, bed angry. Don't let the sun go down on your anger. You know, we can hold grudges, folks. I inherited grudge keeping. It's in my genes. <laughs> That's why I had to be born again. <laughs> oh, I remember, and my husband will tell me, I forgot, but I know you remember, because I'll tell him, on this day at 3 o'clock, <laughs> but thank God he forgets. Micah 7, verses 18 and 19. Somebody want to read that? Who is a God like our God? Somebody want to read it? Micah chapter 7, verses 18 and 19. Just, and then we can do our vignettes. You got it? Would you read it, Kathy? Thanks. Who is a God like you, hardened iniquity, and passing over the transgression of the remnant of his heritage? He does not retain his anger forever because he delights in mercy. He will again have compassion on us and will subdue our iniquities. He will cast all our sins into the depths of the sea. Ha. <laughs> You know, so if God can throw my sins away, I, I, I'll join him. I'll just give him some more to take, and you can take this. But I'm going to give you a few little vignettes. Let's look. Uh, you, you have them in front of you. Um, the first one, it says, the pastor or a church leader says, Sister B, Sister Rosa, you make the best enchiladas in the area. It's chili. It's chili? Okay. <laughs> you don't? I'm not Mexican. I don't care. All right. Well, who does? All right. So uh, Puerto Ricans don't make enchiladas? Thank you for that. Okay. <laughs> Thank you for that cultural uh, competence lesson. Thank you very much. Anyway, you make the best blank. Chili. Chili. In the area, and our visitor from the GC this Sabbath especially loves chili. So you make six of them for the meal after church and uh, in honor of our guests. See, it said six. Hint a lot of six. But anyway, you make six of them. So you make six pots of chili. What do you think? You, it will what? It will all go. It will all go. So you would do it? Wait, 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 wait. Now this is given a, a, as a vignette of abuse. It's saying, hey, Rosa, you make the best chili, so you make the chili for the GC leader. Ted Wilson's going to be here, and you just make six pots of chili for the... He's just telling you. Bless you, my child. Okay. But so I could just say, Rosa, you make the best chili, so I'm coming next week. I want a pot of chili. And you will not consider that abuse? Okay, put my order in now. Oh, holding out. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So now the, the discussion has gone into a whole different direction. But, well, now, now, Brother Carlos, how is this abuse? This is according to, I love this, because, because he what? It's abuse because he was not asking her chance. Uh, she did not have a choice. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, he told her he had expectations, and there was no wiggle room for her to, you know. And see, this was the example of positional. Uh, this person has a position, and used the power that way. Yes, Gabby. Oh, Mario, what? Okay. Even worse, worse. I can give you even a worse version. Okay. If you love the Lord, 
Yeah. Yeah, there it is. The guilt trip. That's that's it. Absolutely, it is. Oh, y'all know this one, okay. (laughs) He's not not even offering um, a stipend or something to get the the thing. You know, he's not, yeah, he's not even, yo, do you have enough pot? Do you need help? You know, nothing of the, to consider what she has to go through. It's just deliver. All right, everybody, you listening? So we need to ask, but you're right. There's the arm twisting, the spiritual arm twisting. I've heard over the years, you know, if you say no to the nominating committee, you say no to, to God. Jesus, yes. That's you know, you, this is God is asking you. I'm not asking you to be on the board. But isn't, but isn't that what we do? Pastor knows it. It's true. <laughs> You're guilty. Awesome. <laughs> sometimes Well, Pastor, now that you're accountable, you have to be responsible, as they said in the... Okay. If everybody says no? That's a good point. If everybody is saying no to the pastor... Uh-oh. So that would be it. So we go back to that pastor who's dogmatic and bombastic and dictatorial. He's the one that bullies everybody into doing what he wants, though. He's not asking, right? He's not going to ask as nicely as you. He's going to tell people this is what you're going to do, and he's going to call them at home. Oh, so somebody would tell him, no, I can't do it. But you know what? What you bring up is a good point, because a lot of times... We, we have such a warped view of God from, from uh, whatever we're experiencing in church that we often feel that we feel intimidated by God. That somehow God will be displeased with you. And you're going to, huh? You don't feel that? I'm glad. You'd have to tell him. And then you call us, you ring. Okay, okay. <laughs> yes, Barbara. Yeah, the reason we feel that way because the enemy is in our ear telling us, oh, hmm. God would like you to say no. He wants you to say yes. And so then we think about it for a while and then we decide, well, maybe I should say yes. Uh huh, uh huh. Because that's, we're working our way to heaven. Right. See, that yeah. gets back then to this whole legalism <laughs> that you brought up. Yes is the answer. The problem is <laughs> yes is the answer. The motivation. The motivation. Uh, I, I'm doing my job as an elder or as a deacon because the pastor pushed me, or because it's my desire to serve. That's right. Well, I'm see, sure. yeah, yeah. So yeah. saying yes is the right answer. Huh? Mm. But what's the motivation? Okay. Did you everybody hear that? Wait, Gabby, and then you. Uh, that's okay. No, go ahead. Wow. Yeah. So there are a lot of dynamics in this, but the key thing. Yes, the answer is yes, but the key thing is to ask. Yeah. Yes. Do it with love, right? My sister, go ahead. Yes, a girlfriend of mine gave me a joke about this whole scenario because I used to stress out about having to feel obligated 
to do things and stuff like that. And there was a time where the saying was, what would Jesus do? What would Jesus yeah. do? And yeah. she gave me the perfect answer. I, I almost passed out because they're so cute. She said, but you're not Jesus, so who? <laughs> you hear that? <laughs> but you're not Jesus. OK. Maria. That's, you yes. Have, if you're not able, if you don't have the resources to make six pots of chili, then you can only do two. Then two is what you can do, and you're willing to do it with your heart to say yes. But you have to be honest and say, you're going to have to have help for the other four, because I can only give two. There you go. Now, that, that's accountability to yourself yes. and to, yes. I think that's a different vignette. <laughs> I know, I know. I'm like, I'm looking, I said, no, we didn't have that one. Okay. <laughs> hey, that's a good one, Pastor. Yeah, that's very interesting. And I'm, I'm looking at these dynamics. I was thinking, okay, how is she going to handle this? Well, yeah. Say what? <laughs> okay, oops, sorry. Well, that's true. I think that gets back to what Barbara said earlier about knowing people. And you know, sometimes we don't have to have a lot of time with people. We can read. If you're being per perceptive, you can read people. We have to earn their life. That's it. Yeah, yeah. So that, that really turned into, actually, I am gonna to talk to you about some chili rolls. So, so. <laughs> And I, I'm going to talk to you, too, after this. So if you're holding out, I'm going to get you for that. Now, now there's some other vignettes that are m much more sensitive. And, and this one, uh, under vignette B, we look at a pathfinder leader. So is that a, they're certainly positional, but there's also, um, as a pathfinder leader, that person is interacting with young people. So he's an, he or she is an adult. And it says here, uh, this leader is helping to teach 12-year-olds to swim for their swimming honor. The leader consistently supports the swimmers as they are learning to face float by placing a hand on their genital area as they swim. The leader also strokes and caresses their bodies as a way of showing appreciation for how well they are doing. Yeah, it's horrible. But let me tell you, this kind of stuff, they're leaders in the church. And it's happening. I, because uh, I know this is on YouTube, I can't say too much. But I have to say, I've seen how positions can be um, abused. But what was more disturbing for me is the lack of accountability on the part of the parents who knew. There are times when there are certain things that happen 
and the children are not believed. They are dismissed because of the personal relationship that the, the parents may have with that particular leader. Yeah, that's the part that gets me really in a bunch. I mean, really upset. Because what is the message then we are giving to our children? I mean, every time people say things like, you know, where are the young people? We need to do this. It's not a, it's not a what's the word, a rocket science. We are often just opening the door for the enemy because we don't want to rock the boat. If you are aware of something like this in any way and you do nothing, you are complicit. Yes. 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 What you just said is so critical and, and was part of the issue I had with some of the things that was put in these slides. Because if you've been conditioned a certain way, just to say, well, let us do this and amen. Uh, mm -mm. Yeah, and I can read the scripture, but if I've been conditioned, conditioned in that way, these scriptures bounce off me. I don't have a way of internalizing because that's not how I was conditioned. It's true, and it happens way too often. And that gets me back to that thing. As adults who know, if you know certain things are going on, what is your responsibility? And, and this is not just about to the leader, but this is to God. Now, this is not manipulation. You, God is going to ask you, what, what did you do? Melvin. Uh, when, when you tell the, the controversies that have erupted in all the churches, uh, complacency it seems to be um, something that you all have in common. Mm. Oh yeah, that's exactly right. That's exactly right. And unfortunately, you know, I've worked with situations and the kid is not believed. And it's like, children don't make that stuff up. Four and five year olds don't say stuff like this. Hey, yeah. Mm -hmm. Hold on. Because when we talk about abuse, when we talk about minimization, denying, or blaming, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The, the, the victim is then re-victimized by a system that doesn't support them in that uh, issue that above. And, absolutely. That's, that's so, so true. Yes, ma'am. You had your hand. Mm. Okay, y'all been put on notice. Me and her, at least two of us. No, but seriously, that, that is, um, if we have to, if we're gonna follow Jesus, we're gonna rock the boat. Yes. What do I mean by that, y'all? What, do you agree? Pastor said yes. Yes. Yes, 
Yes, yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. No, that's I've heard that over and over again. To save people, not systems. That's right. That's right. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, your point is well taken, and unfortunately, I know that to be true. It's just uh, you know, people that are prominent and leadership and have a legacy of leadership and they're big offenders. Yeah, yeah, I know that story. Yes. Yes, yes, a serial abuser. Yes. The story, the story in Judges 19, I, I have some friends that are Adventists and they work in domestic violence. And so they work with survivors and victims. And um, I remember when we came to this story and they were like, whoa, I didn't know that was in the Bible. And I'm thinking, everything's in the Bible. But that is an incredible story. And like when you broke down the verses today, and then when I looked in my Bible, I had the New King James and it talked about how the man said, here, I have this virgin daughter or his wife. And it's like, Oh, uh, what? I mean, if you think about the story of Sodom and Gomorrah, Lot was saying, I have these two daughters here, take them. And, and you know, when you realize what they're saying, yes, they're just saying, these are women, you can have them. Because of the way women were perceived and are still perceived, as you have talked about. But there's a reality if um, when, some, when you read about the woman in Judges 19, I realize that she experienced serial rape, sexual assault. There were multiple offenders involved. The fact that she could even make it back to where her husband or master was is amazing. But she made it and died right there. And his, his reaction, you know, we don't talk about that story in the church. We do not. But that's an incredible story. We did today. <laughs> huh? Real, yeah, because that story, you read it and you cannot leave unimpressed. Because it's, it's like, how could this? And what I love about the Bible, it doesn't sugarcoat anything. It's God is saying to you, oh, yeah, this is sin. This is sin. When you have a depraved mind, you're capable of anything. And, you know, the whole notion of a wife and a concubine. And then we talk about Mormons. I mean, that's nothing new, right? Having all these multiple wives. Then I remember years ago seeing a show on Oprah, and it was called Man Sharing. <laughs> so... We get back to, as the Bible says, there's nothing new under the sun. But then we still have to come back to who we are as a people. And if, if there's an opportunity for you to speak up, prayerfully do so, right? But I hear you, Gabby. I'm feeling you on that. It's, that's, you know, no. Um, Because that's an incredible experience, and it shapes you. It it affects you for the rest of your life. But for the grace of God, and that being born again, that means so much. Huh? It's everything. Knowing Christ, and that gets me back to the sanctuary, and that's where I want to end. Yes, yes, Sophia. Mm Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You seem to get, um, what's the word, what's the word, um, pushback. You, you get pushed back, and the way you treat it from then on, mm-hmm. you know, and your experience is no longer healthy, you know, and your, your, your spiritual growth is, is obstructed, is affected because you told me to speak up because people will not, those who you are speaking to or the fact that you're speaking about, people are not willing 
in you. He is yes. perfect. He is love. And when you're able to embody that, that is how you survive. Had it not been for that, there would be no church existing today because we as humans will not be able to take it. That's a one, yeah. So thank God for grace, for hope, and for converting experience. Yes. Thank you so much because I think this is what the Sabbath school lesson is about in Verity because you, you make a decision based on the consequences. I had to do that once with family. And, you know, it was one of those things where I didn't tell my husband, I didn't tell anybody, but I had information that I needed to act on. And if I hadn't said anything and something had happened, how would I live before God like that? But the consequences were such that uh, that was a bad word. But I, you do have to weigh the consequences. And what helped me was going to my God about it. He's the only one I could trust. And that's the thing. I think that's what our Sabbath school lesson is about. You are going to be in situations as a believer where the, the results are not going to be ideal. But the question is, will we follow Christ no matter what? That's really what we're, so when we come to tests like this, that's just part of the process of refining us, right? Because the objective is, how many of you guys want to see Jesus? Me. Yeah. And we know if it cost him everything, It's like Paul said, he gave that whole list, how many times he had been beaten, shipwrecked, left to die, stoned. I mean, he talked about it. And he said, that's nothing for the cause of Christ. That's what I want. So thank you, sister. You, you bring up the reality. That's the truth. That's just the truth. Yes. Mm -hmm. by the very uh, environment that should be protecting us. And in the church, it shouldn't be like that. But there's a problem. I mean, I mean, first of all, you know, if you're a teacher, if you're this or you're that, you have requirements that, that you're the, uh, you know, psychologist or something. You have reported requirements, you know. And, but, you know, the blowback, the pushback, us as an organization, we have to have a safe place where if there's an issue, it has to be addressed. Christ yeah. like, lovingly, it can't be swept under the rug, it can't be ignored. You hurt the person, the victim, and you re -victim, you victimize the victimizer because the person probably well I don't want to say probably it needs to be addressed. And uh, brought into the light. 
because if in the darkness and it's hidden, it allows sunlight to come and reach it. Thank you. That is just a good point, a relevant point to Tom. Yeah. You understand what I'm saying? I think, yeah. Wrong, but we can't wait for a sign. Amen. Because uh, remember how Elisha told the Lord or prayed and said, Father, show him, show his servant. Because he was like, Father, what are we going to do? Master, they're, they're, all these soldiers are here. And he said, show him. And when he went out and he saw the, the ch fiery chariots all surround him. We have to believe that's true because then there would not have been a Daniel in the lion's den, right? There would not have been, like you said, Azariah, Mishael, and, well, I always call them by the Jewish name, the Hebrew names. But, you know, we, we do have to, that's, that's what, actually Christ gave a parable about that. So you don't start building a house unless you weigh the cost. I think this is a beginning. Brother Carlos, I'm going to let you have the last word and then, then we'll close out. Amen. <laughs> Praise God. Thank you. I think that's a perfect place to, to finish because what I hope is that the women's ministries would create a place for us to come together as sisters and then as families. So I appreciate every one of you who are here. And I just ask that right now we would just bow our heads and... Uh, Thank God for how he's used this time today. Our loving Father, I want to thank you. I want to thank you for always giving us what we need when we need it by your sweet, powerful, loving Holy Spirit. Thank you for the message we heard earlier today, and thank you for helping me with this presentation. I thank you for every person here willing to share their story. And oh God, I just pray for each of us to employ the power of prayer 
in our individual lives. And then as we come together as a body, Lord, allowing your spirit to revive us and to renew us and to restore us. I'm so grateful that in you, we each are new creatures and we can be like you, Lord. Give those old stories, that baggage to you that you can put in the deepest part of the sea. And I just look forward to that time, Lord, when you come through those clouds and we can each say, lo, this is our God and we have waited for him and he will save us. Lord, as we come to you, help us to remember that your only goal is for us to never have to part again. And I thank you in Jesus' name, amen. amen. Thank you for staying by and being willing to share your truth. Oh, praise God. And I want to thank my...